Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Hope everybody's doing well out there. Today we're going to talk about wavetable synthesis, which is one of the most important kinds of synthesizer that we have in the modern era. There's a lot of exciting stuff here, and given what we already know, I think it'll be pretty easy to understand the issues and stuff that you need when building a wavetable synthesizer. So let's go ahead and dive in and talk about this a little. So what's a wavetable synthesizer? Well, it's the simplest idea in the world. You have a waveform associated with every key just stored in memory somewhere. And when you push the key, you play on the speaker the waveform associated with that key. If you are holding down several keys, then you need to mix their waveforms together to get an output waveform. It's as simple in principle as it could possibly get. When I was in undergraduate in the mid 80s, I tried to build out of discrete comp digital components a wavetable synthesizer with tut tutelage by a uh, person who was very good at electronics and I made it about a fifth of the way through the project before I realized that it was a bit more challenging than I was capable of at the time. But that was the era when RAM was getting big enough finally that you could imagine having a few K per sample, which is K bytes per sample, which is a lot in some contexts for this. These days, a few K bytes per sample doesn't sound like that much memory. And so we can get by with some pretty big things. The So we need lots of memory, but it's not really a problem anymore. It's around. The other thing is that we've gotten better at audio compression, and if memory size becomes a problem, we can compress the samples in memory and uncompress them as we need them. That isn't done so much anymore because memory is so cheap, but there you are. Now, the, the issues that are with wavetable synthesis are conceptual issues. They're issues you may not have thought about when you're thinking about the simple idea. The first problem is that, well, and let me be clear, something that should be in these notes but isn't. When I talk about wavetable synthesis, I'm typically talking about synthesis where the wavetables are from some natural source. There's really very little point in building a wavetable synthesizer it's built on square waves and sawtooth waves because I could just generate them myself on the fly. I don't need a wavetable. Where I need a wavetable is where I have some, either some very fancy synthesized sound that took a lot of computation to get, or much more commonly, I've gone out, taken a microphone, and taken a sample or hooked up to an output or whatever, and taken a sample from the natural environment that I want to now treat as a musical note. And, you know, the, the, the conceptual issues that arise there, the first one is that typical sounds that you find in nature don't last forever. And even if they did, I don't have infinite memory per key to store these samples. So I'm going to have to have some plan for playing the sound as long as the key's held down. We normally call this looping, and it's a really important part of a wavetable synthesizer. And... You know, while it would be great if somebody went and sampled a note for all of the, you know, 88 keys or 49 keys or whatever it is I have on my MIDI keyboard, that doesn't seem that realistic a lot of the time. Sure, if you have a piano, that's actually what you do. If you have a harpsichord, it's what you do, and it still doesn't work very well. But if, for example, I'm trying to play a note composed of car horns, you know, song co composed for a car horn, then I'm going to have to probably figure out some way to play at pitches other than the original pitch of the car horn. So I'm going to have to do some pitch shifting to get the sound to be the note that I actually want to play. And again, with the car horn, I may not want to play it with the standard 
car horn envelope, which is to say no envelope whatsoever. When you push a but the horn on your car, it starts sounding instantly, very sharp attack, and then it sustains at that same level until you let go. But I probably would like to have some kind of envelope on that car horn, even if it's a fairly attacky with a, a very short sustain. And finally, just because you've got your sound from nature, you may want to modify the wave before you play it, but you also may want to play it, modify the wave after you play it. So you'll typically, in a resampling synthesizer, have a post effects chain of some kind. You'd like to be able to at least do reverb and things like that that are going to depend not just on the individual note, but the combination of notes that are being played. And so you don't get away from digital signal processing by this trick. So what I want to do in this lecture, and I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, is talk through all of those conceptual issues and talk about how we solve them in typical resampling synthesizers. The resampling synthesizer is a marvel to play. It's incredibly fun to sample sounds and play them. And so all these problems are worth solving, if, and they're all tackleable. But they're going to take a little bit of ingenuity to get solved. First problem is this sustain thing. I really need to be able to play at the sustain level of the ADSR envelope for as long as the key is held down. That's kind of a requirement of most kinds of music. If I want to hold for three measures this key, then it should say make it a noise for three measures. And so our samples, like I say, typically aren't as long as three measures. They're typically shortish. And so we're going to have to do a time stretching thing. We're going to have to be able to loop the signal in such a way that it keeps playing forever by treating it as cyclic. And that's okay. It's a periodic signal. That should be a straightforward thing to do. What could the issue possibly be? Well, the you know, yeah, first thing is that where are you going to actually start and end this loop? And I'll talk a little bit later about that. You know, it would be great if somebody told you what the sustain part of your sample was by marking it manually, but you may have to figure it out yourself because the sound varies over time, like any natural sound would. And so there's two general ways you can loop, just like anything else. The obvious one, if I may, is in the frequency domain, we can take a DFT over a window of samples from our sample, and I'm sorry about this terminology problem. I'm going to be talking today both about samples in the sense of PCM sample values and also about samples in the sense of sounds recorded. So I'm going to take a window of PCM sample values from my sample that I've recorded and DFT it. So now I have it in the frequency domain. Woohoo! And of course, I'm going to have to do the windowing, so blah, blah. And then I can sit there and look at that spectrum and just stretch it out using whatever technique I want, right? Typically, some kind of interpolation between bins if I want to stretch it. Typically, some kind of interpolation of bins if I want to shrink it. That part's pretty straightforward and fairly foolproof. There are some issues, but it's quite doable. And then I just use an inverse DFT and put it back. Now I've got samples and I can put those back with the same window and now I'm good. But of course, that's not going to work because I need to overlap that with another DFT or else I'm going to lose signal at the edges of my window. And besides, you know, the signal may be changing quickly in time. The frequency components of the signal may be changing quickly in time. And so I will overlap, maybe even overlap as much as every single sample. I put a window around it, do a DFT, do my stretch, do the inverse TFT and put it back. And in principle, that should give me something pretty like a looped signal. The problem is that smearing is real, that because the DFT doesn't localize very well in time, it's very hard to tell where the samples start and end, and the more that you do wider DFTs to get a better estimation of the frequencies, 
the less you have localization in time of what you're doing. And so it's a, an approach that can produce loops, but unless the sound is very stable over time in this sustain region, it's gonna produce loops that sound more like sort of an imitation, a blurry imitation of the original than like the original itself. And so that smearing problem's a problem. It's also a problem that you're doing a lot of EFTs per second, but eh, modern computers can handle that part. The real problem is localization. And by the way, I, I've cut this very short. You can use things like wavelets and other stuff to try to get better localization in time in this frequency domain looping. But frequency domain looping's hard. The easier kind, both conceptually and maybe to get good results, is looping in the time domain. And the trick here is to use what's called autocorrelation. The autocorrelation of a signal with itself this is lagged autocorrelation. So I'm going to take the signal and starting at zero, and then I'm going to convolve it with the signal starting later. And so I'm going to multiply and add, just like we've been doing for everything else, to see where the signal matches up with itself, right? And when, of course, the signal is not lagged, it will match up with itself perfectly. I'll get a correlation that you know shows up as essentially squaring the signal. But as I lag, that correlation is going to go down because the samples aren't going to quite match up with the ones under them. But when I get to a single period, then that correlation will go back up again because now essentially I'm squaring the signal again, right? Because the signal's periodic, the it matches with itself. And so now I've found the period. This is a way to find the period. And finding the period is great because now I know sort of in the time domain where the signal starts and ends. And so I can just crop the sample off so the start matches the end. And usually I do that at zero crossings. I originally adjust the sample. Oh, an important point that I missed. And that's treating the signal as cyclic. So to avoid the problem that, you know, as you lag more and more, you start running off the end, we're going to have this convolution wrap around when it gets to the end, wrap around back to the beginning. So all the convolutions will be over the exact same number of samples. It's just that some of them will come from the beginning and some of them will come from the end when you're lagging. And then I'm going to crop it. Usually I start the signal at a zero process, crossing, and I try to find a crop point at the end that's at a zero crossing so that I get a signal that sort of ends as it starts. And now I've got a loop. I've got a signal I can play by just playing it cyclically over and over again. And that's a nice loop signal. Now, the problem, of course, again, with natural sounds is that they're going to vary over the length of this loop. And so if I have a long loop, then maybe the volume starts high and ends low. So when I loop back around, it it's going to vibrate with the loop period, right? I'm going to get vibrato. Maybe the frequency content changes from the beginning to the end of the loop. And so I'm going to get tremolo. I'm going to get weird effects as I cross that loop boundary. And so that's kind of a problem. And I can try to adjust all that away. I can try to AGC the, the sustain real hard so that all the signal at the front and end has the same volume. I can try to adjust the frequencies of the signal from beginning to end by doing some DFTs and filtering to try to get it to be what it's supposed to be. But that way it kind of lies peril. And after all that, maybe I'll have a signal that sort of sounds real. And that's the trick here. The longer the sample, the more it's going to sound like the original natural signal, the more real it will sound. But of course, the longer it is, the more these loop effects are going to be pronounced. A short loop, will the signal at the end will be pretty close to what it is at the beginning. A longer loop, maybe not so much. Now, I've got a loop. Congratulations, that's a thing. That solves the sustain problem. But the other problem I may have, like I said before, is that I may not have a sample for every key 
So now I'm gonna have to pitch shift this thing so that I can take a note sampled at one frequency and turn it into a note played at a different frequency. And even if I do have a sample per key, to be honest, it's pretty common to sample things that are a little out of tune. So I may want to tune it up, tune up all the samples, even if I, even if I have a full set. Notice that really dramatic pitch shifting will really change the character of the sound. If I take a piccolo and play it as a bass instrument, yeah, the pitch shifting works and I can make it work very well, but it's not going to sound like a bass piccolo because what would that even sound like? So the, one of the first problems is, and the way we're going to pitch shift is to resample, just like we have been, right? We've got this loop. It's notionally infinite. I can squash the samples in the loop by decimation. I can stretch the samples in the loop by interpolation. And as I do that, the pitch of the note will change correspondingly. So we uh, can resample to get the pitch to change. One of the first problems that's often neglected is actually if the instrument is out of tune or if you've sampled a car horn or something, you don't actually know necessarily what the fundamental pitch of the original samples is. You know, maybe somebody told you what it is and maybe you can even believe them, but if not, your first problem is, well, if I wanna produce a 440A, what is this sample I'm starting with frequency-wise? And, you know, the sort of standard obvious thing to do is to use the strongest component of the DFT to decide what frequency the original sample was at. And that works pretty well most of the time, but it, there are times when it can really fool you. That car, car horn is a great example because it has two notes in it playing it, typically playing it about the same amplitude. And so what is the fundamental frequency of the car horn? It depends a lot on psychoacoustics. The last thing I'll add is remember, pitch shifting is frequency stretching. We've talked about that before. So when I talk about shifting the pitch of a note, what I really mean is stretching the frequencies that are involved in that note, because otherwise I would have to preserve, as always, sound is logarithmic, I have to preserve harmonics, and so I've gotta be really careful. Now, there are some caveats about how I might want to do this resampling. In our previous studies of resampling, we've done things like decide what the resampling resampled rate is supposed to be, design a 93 coefficient FIR filter on the fly, and then apply it to the loop to get the anti-aliasing I need for resampling. That's may be pretty resource intensive even on a modern computer. Certainly out in the analog days, that wasn't what people did because you didn't have 93 coefficient FIR filters. And so what you would do is typically use a small adjustable IR filter for your anti-aliasing. And it won't work as well, but it means that you don't, you can just adjust a few coefficients. The other thing you can do is to, instead of trying to filter at all, you can play with the time domain. If, if you're pretty close to the frequency you want, then linear interpolation between samples, just literally taking your loop and playing it slower or faster, interpolating between samples to find out what you should play, actually works okay. And so you might resample to only a few frequencies using your fancy resampler, and you can do that in advance before you start playing anything. And having done that resampling so that you have octaves right, you can pick the nearest octave and just loop faster or slower against that octave to get the final pitch that you actually want. You know, linear interpolation's fine. If you want to get fancier, you can do quadratic interpolation or other things. And really, that's a lot more practical in this situation where you're trying to continuously resample the waveform. But again, you know, most of the time, fat chance, but it'd be great to just have a sample for every to begin with, and then you sample any. And then we talked about the envelope problem, right? 
there's sort of two choices, right? Typically, the thing I recorded, the sample that I recorded, has some kind of envelope on it, including some sustain phase and some attack decay release phase, you know, whatever it does at the beginning and end. And sometimes that's exactly what you want if you're trying to record a saxophone, for example, that you probably just want to use the natural envelope at the beginning of that saxophone thing. And a saxophone doesn't really have any fancy sustain. And so, yeah, you sort of take whatever the saxophone player did at the beginning and the end and call it saxophone envelope. But maybe that isn't what you want. Maybe my poor keyboard player really wants to have the saxophone attack hard or fade in slow. Maybe they really want it to have some sustain after they let go of the note. And in those situations, I need a synthesize some kind of envelope and I have to probably in that situation I want to combine the natural envelope with the synthetic envelope and it all gets really super weird and you know really this should be up to the musician not to the designer so a good synthesizer will allow either of these options or some combination of both of them and again just like it's hard to find the period of a sample, it's hard to find the start and end of the sustain part of a sample. If you can add heuristics to guess that, or ideally it'll come with them. And sort of a standard way of dealing with samples for wavetables is not to sample them yourself. The sampling synthesizer I've described up to now is sort of like the old Fairlight. I literally put my sample next to a microphone and record it and I'm often sampling, which is obviously the most fun, but a lot of times it's more practical to use samples somebody else already got for you. If I want to produce an orchestra effect, for example, with the wavetable synthesizer, I probably don't want to go find every instrument in the orchestra and record it. And so there's this notion that's been floating around for a long time of a sound font this is a, there's literally a format called sound font, which is a standard file format for wavetables, and it's set up for being used by synthesizers. So there's this sound font file that you can have. It's crazily complicated. All the things that we've talked about as far as choices about how the wave should be represented and marked and blah, 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 have to be captured by this file format. And so usually you don't, just like you don't try to process even something as simple as wave files on your own, you almost always want to use somebody else's sound font library who's put a lot of work into it. And then you think have to think really carefully after looking at the sound font spec and the library API, how you want to deal with these wave files, but having, you know, waveforms and samples. But having done that, it can provide an immense amount of power. You can have a whole library of sounds at your fingertips ready to be loaded into your wavetable synthesizer. And if you're going to do general MIDI, which is one of the last things I want to talk about, then synthesizers are almost always, the general MIDI synthesizers are almost always from some kind of sound fonts. There's standard general MIDI sound fonts readily available, both free or very, very expensive, depending on. So what's general MIDI? Well, it's a standard for cross-manufacturer synth capabilities. At some point, everybody realized that, especially with wavetable synths, they might need some kind of standard for so that you could a musician could go from one MIDI synthesizer to another and expect to find the same sorts of standard things on both. And so this is an attempt to sort of describe what a synthesizer is in terms of wavetables. It's called general MIDI because it's very closely coupled to the MIDI standard, although it's not part of the MIDI standard. The most important thing it does is it says, well, we're gonna take 128 specific MIDI programs in a MIDI program bank, and we're gonna say those are specific named sounds. We're just gonna standardize. We're gonna build the giant table of synthesizer sounds, and there'll be 128 of them in that giant table. And if we go down and look at the, um, program change events table, we can um, see that there's, you know, piano sounds, chromatic percussion, organ, guitar, blah, blah. There's a lot of different things in here. I picked out some examples that, you know, alto saxophone is on 66. Yes, there's an alto 
tenor and uh, bass saxophone. Um, I think maybe soprano sax. One of the two. There's the blown bottle sound. If you want to play blown bottles, well, that's General MIDI seventy program seventy seven. Rock organ is 19, okay. Slap bass, bass one. There's slap bass one and slap bass two on separate programs. This is one of these situations where um, you might want two different slap basses depending on what you're doing. The bagpipe is number 110. I find it awkwardly placed in a category called ethnic sounds, which seems a little eh, to modern ears, I think, but there's some stuff in there. And if you want to play the helicopter, well, that's General MIDI Sound 126. So it really does cover quite a wide range of things. And yet, 128 sounds, there's a lot more than 128 sounds in the world. But, you know, it's a start of the thing. And these names, right? I mean, when I say rock organ sound, you and I could mean some pretty different things by that, and it's really up to the manufacturer to decide which sample, what a rock organ sample should sound like, gather it up, and you know, the person who builds the synthesizer gets to decide what a rock organ sounds like. Typically, it would be a Hammond organ, and I think they're mostly just trying to avoid the brand name, but still. Oh, and by the way, if 128 sounds weren't enough, there's also a set of, I don't know, 30 or something percussion sounds on a, that are, if you make these program changes on channel 10. So having run out of numbers, they picked, said, well, channel 10's the percussion channel. And anytime you receive a channel 10 program, then you should treat that as a percussion sound. Now, general MIDI isn't just about instrument names. It also covers some other things. It requires, for example, 24 voice polyphony, at least 16 instrument voices, and up to eight percussion voices if you do percussion. And that's one of those requirements that sounds great. I'm not actually sure that it's very tightly followed, but technically you can not call your synthesizer a general MIDI synthesizer unless it offers 24 voice polyphony. There are certain standard MIDI control change messages that must be honored. So instead of just the wild west of controls where most of the control change numbers aren't really defined by the MIDI standard very well, uh, they say, no, you gotta have this set of controls on your synthesizer. Things like the expression pedal has to be, you know, the, the sustain pedal has to be there. The pitch bend has to be there, et cetera, et cetera. And that way, you can be confident if you walk up to a general MIDI synthesizer that you know some of what it can do with controls. And then there's a, it wasn't enough. So there's general MIDI level two. The general MIDI two standard extends all of this quite a bit. A lot of instruments are still general MIDI one in current year because really it covers most of what you need. But of course, if you buy a multi-thousand dollar digital workstation, it's going to have a GM2 compliant mode for sure. The last thing I'll say about all of that is if you've watched TV, if you've gone to the movies, if you listen to any kind of sort of scored music, you've heard General MIDI a lot. It's become a real, it's probably most important use at this point is not with Know, pop musicians or whatever, although they use it a lot too. If you listen, especially if you listen to things like hip hop, yeah, those are general MIDI sounds a lot. But certainly, your background music in your television show, the themes in your movie scores are going to draw heavily on sounds pulled from the general MIDI band. So even if you've never used a general MIDI instrument, you pretty much know the general MIDI sounds. And that's what I've got for you today. I think wavetable synthesizers are a fantastic thing. I've spent a lot of time playing with them over the years. And it's a really fun thing that really is rooted in the digital age. We don't have any equivalent in analog or in natural instruments of the capabilities of a wavetable synthesizer. So 
that's that i think uh, next time we'll talk about some fancy synthesis techniques we haven't yet in the meantime stay safe out there and i'll talk to you again soon thanks for listening